This is JT Tran on our Facebook Live, second time around, and we're going to talk about inner game. I am USA's number one Asian dating coach, and here we have Andrew, who's also going to talk about inner game and how he used what he learned to basically heal things that happened in his life and how he's become just a, a stronger, more confident person by using emotional intelligence, okay? So, you know, hit the like button if you have any friends that you want to share this with. Please uh, share it with them. You want to set up a little? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, first of all, what is inner game? Okay, let me give you my definition. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different for every person because confidence is an evolution. It's a process and it's a journey. But to me, inner game is one of the most powerful but also misunderstood aspects of your personality and how it can affect your confidence and your life. I like to use the analogy that inner game is your inner compass. It is your sort of like GPS system where, you know, when it comes to pickup or business or just life in general, if you need to go from one side of the street to like the other side, or if you need to go to the other side of town, you can just go, you know, with technique. Like I need to drive left, need to drive right, take a U-turn, what have you. But if you have to have a really big goal that is, say, transforming your life when it comes to like women or comes to business or other aspects of your life, you need a GPS system, right? Because if you're trying to go from California all the way to New York, or if you're trying to go from like, say, a virgin who's never dated in his entire life, you don't know how to incorporate like a social circle, you need a GPS because if you're trying to go from California to New York, you might end up in a completely wrong state, right? So it's more than technique, all right? Inner game gives you a map, a roadmap to how to implement big positive changes in your life. Now, got a bunch of great questions, and one of the really big questions I got asked was from Johnny. So it's a little bit long, so, you know, bear with me. Say, hey, JT, thanks for reaching out. Uh, to be honest, I've struggled even entering social situations these days because the vast majority of women my age refuse to hold eye contact with me and their facial expressions and negative body language when I'm in their proximity or approaching them feels like a hard rejection right before they even approach. And I was wondering if this was normal or something I had to push through uh, to break past that Asian male heuristic. And I carried with me throughout the night. Um, and basically it's very difficult and time consuming as it is a PTSD trigger uh, because how people treated me when my skin was horribly disfigured for years, okay? When I meet women who doesn't show this kind of physical disgust on my presence, uh, which is rare, then it's easy for me to talk to her. So obviously this, this man, um, he had some sort of like skin condition where he felt horribly disfigured. and. You know, Andrew is a great uh, spokesman for this, uh, and he can speak on this because I'm going to show a picture, yeah. you know. Um, graphic warning, okay, graphic warning, if you are uh, easily disturbed by sort of um, uh, scars, then, you know, turn away, okay. <laughs> so, this was Andrew, or about how many years ago? Five, six seven years ago five six you know a quite a few ago. years ago right and what happened well he'll tell you but this okay again graphic warning guys all right this is Andrew about five six years ago uh, you guys can see that be sure to hit the like okay <laughs> <laughs> this is Andrew right? <laughs> like that photo right so you want to give a little bit of background of what happened um yeah so I was going through a phase in my life where in search of meaning in creating meaning in my life, I resorted to many different avenues. And one of the avenues I resorted was partying in um, the hippie playa desert community. And one of the things I took on was spinning fire. At the time, I thought, you know, hey, if I do this cool thing, then people will find me interesting and people will like me. And what I didn't consider take into consideration was the risk that came with it. Right, because you weren't <laughs> trained in this thing that you're about no. to do. No, you're just having fun, and yeah. then what happened? So it was a lot of practice, and 
in one of the events I performed at, I ended up lighting my face on fire. Lighting his face on fire. Again, you're doing like a, what do you call it, fire twirling. Yeah. Okay, so obviously that was painful, but it was something that you, you had to go to the hospital for, and then, you know, there was that obvious physical, you know, pain and, and scarring. But like, men, like that can heal, but mentally, how did that affect you? I mean, even in, while I was laying in the hospital, I remember getting debris, and again, this is a little graphic, I remember the doctor cleaning off the dead skin from my face, and all I could see on the nurse who was supporting him was this look of disgust. Yeah. Like, she was, like, cringing, almost looking at the procedure that was being done. And I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be the rest of my life. Yeah. I am going to be living with this. People are going to look at me in disgust. And... To get back to your question, at the time when it happened, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know what life was going to be like, how this was going to affect me. And all I could think of was the obstacle that was in my way, mm -hmm. which is now I'm disfigured. Right. And for a long time, I focused on me being disfigured and having that be the context where I was living out of. So when I was in interactions, I would talk to people, and in the back of my mind, I'll be thinking, oh, they're looking at my scars, they're looking at my scars, they're looking at my scars, and almost even before giving them a chance to actually bring it up, I was distant, distancing myself from them. You brought it up first, yeah. like in your mind and in your actions, yeah. even though at a certain point, like, you, you healed from it, mm -hmm. right, and they couldn't see it, but you carried that with you, and this is why, like, inner game, inner game can literally manifest itself in your quote unquote outer game in your actions because your thoughts affect your words and your actions mm -hmm. right um, and then how did you like slowly transform that where you didn't have you didn't carry that burden for me my come from is what I focus on is what I grow if I focus on the scars that I have or these limitations that I have then that's what I'm going to be growing and for me, being scarred and having these scars, I couldn't change it. So I started thinking to myself, why is it that I'm focusing on something that I can change? And having that be a back door for me to not create the things that I desire in life. And at the time, it was creating intimate relationships with women. Right. And it became a back door for me to be like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to express myself. I'm going to hold myself back. I'm not going to approach, I'm not going to say hi, I'm not going to create these relationships because I'm scarred. Because mm -hmm. it was easier for me to say, I'm scarred, so therefore it's not going to happen. Like you were rejecting them first exactly. before they could reject you. Yeah, almost. I, I was rejecting myself first. Mm -hmm. I was saying no to myself and not even giving me the, myself the opportunity to create the things I desire. Right. And then, you know, that was how you actually came into the ABCs of Attraction because you took the boot camp and realized that, hey, they can't see, like, you know, who you were before, just how you present yourself right now. And then, you know, you took what you learned and applied it and then you got good. But, you know, for a lot of guys who don't take boot camps, like, what are some ways that, because you study a lot of, like, just social, you know, emotional intelligence and, and self-development um, beyond just pickup. Like, what are ways that guys that are watching this right now, where the, you know, they might not have had actually been physically scarred, but they have, like, internal trauma, right, that they carry with them that no one can see, but they carry it with them. And how do you recommend, do you have, like, techniques, um, any kind of tactics, any kind of exercises, mental exercises, where they can slowly start the process of healing from their trauma? I think it's important to have a vision. A vision. Okay. A vision. Like, what is it that I'm intending to create? And from there, have whatever obstacle become an opportunity mm -hmm. for me to create it. So, for example, mine was I wanted to create intimate relationships. And scarring, being scarred was an obstacle. Right. So, what would it look like in my life if the relationships I created got, went beyond me being scarred or me being disfigured? And if I focused on that, what would it look like if I grew that aspect, as opposed to the obstacle itself? Because when I look at the obstacle, it's like the Empire State Building in front mm -hmm. of me. However, once I pass it and I look back, stepping into the now known, it turns into like a mouse turret. It's tiny. Because right. I've already gone through it. 
And I think a lot of things that held me back was coming to a place where I said, I don't know, and stopping. Where now I look at it, I don't know as the platform, as the, the ground I stand on for me to create something different, for me to create anything new, for me to right. reinvent, rediscover, and find out things about me and who I am as a man, who I am as a person. Right. So you're saying like you, you accept the unknown nature of whatever it is that is affecting you, and you use that as a platform to say, like, I'm going to change this, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to explore whatever healing that I need to do, right? Because there's something I think that is called chronic uniqueness, where I've had students that think that their particular problem is unique to them and only them, right? Mm -hmm. It is like, you know, it's like approach anxiety or, you know, I, I'm socially scared or I'm just nervous talking in public or anything like that. And that's unique to them. And in that mentality, they think that that problem is unsolvable, that they can't go out and fix that, right? They don't simply accept that, hey, you know what? Other people have been in that situation mm -hmm. and they accept that the premise that, you know, that this is something that is unknown, but there's a solution to it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, get, you have to carve that path forward. So um, beyond that though, are there, are there ways for you to sort of like what they can do in a daily life to change their mentality? Yeah, absolutely. So creating a self-acknowledgement is a powerful part of my day. Like I have timers set up in my day where it reminds me to acknowledge myself for what I'm creating and who I'm being, more importantly, who I'm being. Because mm -hmm. um, who I'm being dictates my actions. If I'm being courageous, if I'm being loving, then my actions are going to transcribe as being courageous or being loving. And if I'm being in self-beat up, or if I'm being in lack of worth or lack of self-worth, then those are the actions that I'm going to be creating. So it's creating reminders for me to acknowledge the gift that I am right. as unique because at the end of the day, the way I love, the way I interact, the way I connect with people is unique. Only I can do that. Right. And how long have I spent looking at all the greatness of others and wishing and wanting to be like them when I can create it myself, my version of it? Right. There is something in basic like psychology where when you write down a goal, when you write down a vision or verbally express it or even tell somebody, you're more likely to actually accomplish it as opposed to just sort of like ruminating it in your mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know some people say like manifesting and some people like for me, for example, um, when it gets a little bit like hippie, like wording out, I just tune it out because yeah. it gets a little bit too like mystical, right? I'm like, you know, former engineer. <laughs> but there is a real psychological principle at play, right? Whenever I wrote like film apart, things that happened to me, the act of actually acknowledging it in the world beyond just your mental state forces you to actually like realize it as as a real phenomenon and then you can take that process and you, and you take that step forward once you admit that this is an issue this is something that you can you know you recognize acknowledging it in the real world has a very actual effect and when you say it when you verbalize it when you tell somebody or even when you write it down your vision whatever it is it makes it real, which means that you are more effective at tackling it, Absolutely. right? So my come from with it is dreams declared deliver. Am I willing to mm. take the first step and declare it out into the world? Say that again. Dreams declared delivered. Okay. So am I willing to take a risk standing in the un unknown? I don't know how I'm going to get there and declaring it that I'll do whatever it takes, creating that commitment with myself and the integrity with myself, myself and my word in declaring it and making it happen until I'm willing to take a stand that it's going to happen or even see it as a possibility mm -hmm. I'm shooting around in the dark I'm walking around in circles right also one technique that I found really useful is the idea of reframing mm -hmm. an obstacle in my mind right and the thing is like you know none of us are ever 100 you know percent confident 24-7 and there are times for me that, you know, I have to travel, I have to do all this, you know, part of my career, my, my company, there was a time when I was just getting like really just sort of tired of some of the aspects of, you know, you know, running the ABCs where 
it was like, okay, I've got to like answer a hundred emails. I've got to go on these boot camps. I got to travel. It's like eight hour flights, and it's like physically and emotionally exhausting, right? But then I, you know, I was able to reframe it. Like, instead of saying like I have to like go on this eight hour flight, I would reframe it as like I have this this opportunity. I am blessed to travel to a different city Absolutely. to help out men who, you know when they themselves, you know, actualize their lives can go out and have positive relationships with women. And that actually helped a lot and I was able to go from this sort of like sort of just a little bit put upon um, kind of businessman to someone that would embrace like this instead of an obstacle but a, a blessing. And what I'm hearing you say at the core of it is that your visions dictated your actions. Mm -hmm. Your visions became greater than whatever obstacle came in your way. And one thing that I faced in the past was I was always waiting for motivation or inspiration to strike. Right. And these feelings, which in reality, feelings are like farts. <laughs> they, they come and they go, you know, and I'm relying on these feelings and these senses of motivation and inspiration to strike to take action. I'm always going to be waiting. What if it never comes? Mm -hmm. So the shift for me has been moving from feelings, motivations, and inspiration into what is my vision and living a vision-driven life, a purpose-driven life, and having that be my guide, where my commitment trumps all obstacles, where my vision is so grand and it comes alive in me and it fuels every action that I take. That, to me, the way I would translate that, especially for those of you guys who are in the pickup, is the idea of external versus internal validation. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys in the pickup is like, hey, you know, I'm unhappy, so I need to go out and get a girlfriend. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's just a problem, but a lot of other times that's just the symptom. That's like Absolutely. the band-aid. And in fact, what you got, some guys have to do is learn to be happy with themselves mm -hmm. before they try to ha meet a girl that will make them happy, <laughs> right? And you get the, you see this a lot, and it, it's not just pickup, it's, it's other arenas of business, guys who just obsessed about their next payday or, you know, sales where you are only happy when you are externally validated by something outside of you. Yeah. And when you live a life of your vision, when you have a clear idea of it and you pursue it every day, then you are internally validated. Because I think I was fortunate enough in my life that I've had achievements where, you know, whenever I wanted to be like, you know, a rocket scientist or when I got to this, I was fortunate that I discovered the vision in myself and I pursued that. Right? Not everybody has that opportunity though. And so how do they go about discovering their vision? Is there a process? Yeah, if they're absolutely. a little bit lost, how do they go about discovering their vision so that they can guide their inner game? So what's worked for me is creating awareness. Until I know where I'm at, I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So I create awareness to where, I, where I'm at. And from there, I look at what's stopping me. What are the prices that I'm paying by not taking action? To where I want to go. Mm -hmm. So once I get make it real and really take a look at the prices that I'm paying, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in that raise that I've been wanting, or that connection with my parents, or whatever it may be, what are the prices I'm paying? And I ask myself the question, how much longer do I want to pay those prices? Because until I'm willing to take action, then those are the prices that I will continuously be paying. Do you have a specific example of one area or aspect of your life where you created a vision? Uh, sure. So, for example, um, I created a business, um, an online business, and at the time, I was thinking, oh, you know what, I'm, I told myself the story that I'm such a great personality that people are going to want to hire me, people are going to want to hire me based off of my personality alone. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in the waiting game waiting for people to come hire me, people to come hire me, people to come <laughs> hire me. You know, I'm so great. You know, I'm having these social interactions. People should see the value that I pr provide for them. Right. And what was what the prices that I were paying were obviously not getting a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, I wanted someone outside of me to do the work for me. Mm -hmm. And the shift for me in creating that awareness is realizing that if it's to be, it's up to me. If a job, in this case, is what I wanted, then it's up to me to create the value for others to want to hire me. In this case, taking action, even presenting the option of, hey, you know, I'm looking to get hired. And 
it's, it's really fundamental, but how I do one thing is how I do everything. So this translated into how I was approaching um, social interactions. This translated into how I was dealing with relationships. I never presented and took the risk of being rejected mm -hmm. and presented the option of, hey, let's go grab lunch. Hey, let's sit down together. Let's get to know each other. And it's that risk that, for me, was scary. Right. And it was easy for me to pay the prices of, you know, not getting the things I want in order to feel comfortable, in order to stay safe. And it goes back to what I was talking about earlier when I don't know now becomes an opportunity for me to paint and create whatever it is I desire. So now whenever I feel, when I'm faced with I don't know, it excites me. Right. As opposed to scares me because it's up to me to create it. I have complete ownership of it. Right. I think there was a really cool quote by Will Smith. I forget the title, but it's, it's getting a job as a, a stockbroker or something. He has, he has this kid that he has to raise and in the job interview. Percentage. The guy, yeah, the, the guy, the, the boss asks, you know, like a question. And Will Smith basically says, like, if I don't know it, I'll go find out the answer. Or I'll go find out someone that can teach me, right? And so whenever you are faced with this unknown, like, instead of being stumped and, and feeling depressed about it, like take ownership, like Andrew was saying, and say like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this, I'm gonna go and, and find a resource, I'm gonna find somebody, but I'm gonna take proactive measures, mm -hmm. right, to fix this. Um, so, if you guys have questions, all right, start hitting them, hitting us up, all right, like, share, or right, we're gonna give a, a free gift at the end of this, um, and, you know, like, we teach boot camps, I teach, like, you know, ABCs of Attraction, and if you guys find value in this, whether it's inner game, outer game, then please message me after this, and I'll tell you about a special promotion that we're offering for the Los Angeles uh, Premium Boot Camp. Um, so, some questions, uh, starting in this up, um, but let me see, it says, Nobody, his name is Nobody is, what is approach anxiety? If it's not instinctual, you know, if it's not natural, is it man-made? And I guess, you know, how would you use inner game to deconstruct that? <laughs> uh, I mean, it goes back to, I don't know. Approach anxiety is walking on the skinny branches. Mm. Is, is really saying, like, I don't know what the hell is going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. And it's, it's 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 a platform for me to look at. Am I willing to be uncomfortable? That's approach anxiety. Like, I'm uncomfortable right now, and do I choose to say, uh, continue walking even though I'm uncomfortable, or do I choose to stay in my comfort and create the same results? At the end of the day, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. So approach anxiety naturally comes in and it's like an opportunity for me to look at whether or not I want to create the same results or am I willing to reinvent and rediscover and stand in what's uncomfortable in the moment for my vision. Yeah. Basically, you know, one of the things I go through the boot camp is like if your why is big enough, if your vision is big enough, you won't let any of these obstacles, you know, quote unquote obstacles stand in your way. You embrace it, you use it to excite you, all right? A lot of naturals, they don't have like the, the you know, the approach anxiety because to them, they associate like great reward when it comes to talking to women. So if your vision is like, I want to be surrounded by beautiful women, or I want to be surrounded by, you know, a, a great business with great clients and, and being a successful like businessman, like you got to embrace that. Um, here's an interesting one uh, from Lee. It's like, what if I am being gaslighted, um, you know, by my friends, and you know, should I cut them out of my life? For those you know, gaslighted is when people are kind of like trying to. Hmm, what's the way? It's a very kind of like uh, political term in the fact that they're trying to change the way you think, or or fooling you into thinking the universe is one way when in fact objective reality is is different. Do you know what he means by this? No. Nah. Say that again? Basically, it says, like, you know, I'm being gaslighted, and how do I know when to cut certain friends from my circle, right? Because, I mean, they, let's put it this way, you know, how William, when he took the boot camp, like, his friends were saying, like, 
oh, why are you working out? You look like a meathead and you look like you're doing steroids. Or why are you changing your head? You look gay. Or why are you talking to girls? You're embarrassing like the Asian race. Like that's what they're saying. From my perspective, when I take a change in my life, people have to learn who I relearn who I am. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable for them. Right. So rather than focusing on what may what they think, what am I committed to? Like, and it's not it's not about whether or not I'm choosing to cut them out of my life. It's really it's my life. What do I want to create in my life, and what will support me in creating that? If friends now become something that. Or, or become people who are holding me back from it, then maybe it's time for me to re-examine what, where this friendship is at, where this relationship is at, and what it really is about. Yeah. I recommend uh, to Lee that sometimes, you know, if you're going through self-growth and you're changing yourself both physically, mentally, and emotionally, to not necessarily cut them out completely, but like press pause. Because like you're saying, like they, when you're going through changes and they see it live, they don't quite understand it because they themselves aren't going through the same steps and journey that you are. So maybe press pause on it and then reconnect with them like three, six months later and then you just say like, hey, you know, I, I took an emotional challenge in class. I took a, like a boot camp or something like that. And then they'll get it, right? Because there is that sort of like that distance um, between like the old you and the new you. But obviously, if your quote unquote friends are still being negative and still gaslighting you, then it might be time to really cut them off because maybe they aren't real friends. And really, it's also feedback for you or feedback for me when my friends are gaslighting me or my friends are stopping me from my growth. Mm -hmm. It's who am I being such that I'm not conveying to them why it's so important to me. And if they're really my friends, who am I being to not allow them to see that What's important to me will change and support our relationship growing, right. growing together. Okay. Uh, here's another great question from Peter. How do I reframe my perspective to the view that I am the prize and the challenge and that I don't have to chase after women? Hmm. Right? Again, this is something that could be like in Shell's business, like you know, your, your family. Um, like how, 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 would he, how do you suggest that he reframes his perspective? Uh, I mean... I don't know how else to say it than to just say it. <laughs> like, my perspective is mine to choose. My actions are mine to choose. And when I realize that I have the choice to design my life the way I've always wanted to, then it's up to me. And really, anything else that holds me back is a conversation that I'm acting out of fear. So rather than having a fear-driven life, again, come from a vision-driven life, and I, I know I've been saying this over and over and over again, the truth of it is right here, right now, is the only moment for anything to be created. So who I am choosing to become right here, right now, in this moment will dictate the next. And who I choose to be in that moment will continue to grow. And practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent, or practice is what I good at, get good at. So what am I choosing to practice? Am I going to choose to practice telling myself that I'm not worth it? Am I going to choose to practice of telling myself that I'm not good enough? Or am I going to choose to practice telling myself that I am worth it? That I do have what it takes? Right. All right. Uh, again, this is JT Tran from the ABCs of Attraction, America's number one Asian dating coach. Joined today by Andrew, one of the best guys I know when it comes to inner game. He's gone from someone that was at the lowest point of his life and has built himself up to be not only just, you know, personally and romantically successful, but professionally as well. Uh, so feel free guys to ask questions. We're gonna go for another, I know we had a little bit of technical difficulty in the middle there, but maybe another 10 minutes. So um, we hit a bunch of questions that came to us. Right now, ask your questions guys, because otherwise, you know, if you don't ask, you can't get it answered, okay? Put it out there. We've been talking about this all day. You got to realize it, okay? You actually have to write it down, and that is the first step of recognizing, identifying the problem is to acknowledge it. So, write down your question so that we can answer, okay? Um, hey, Autumn, how's it going, man? Uh, so Edwin, uh, thanks, Eugene, for the for the uh, the movie quote. Yep, Pursuit of Happiness by Will Smith. Uh, Edwin says, we already answered his question. <laughs> All right, great, great. Yeah. 
So, and then Shandu asks, is it fair to say a bit of narcissism is healthy? I think we were literally just talking about this before the video. Um, until I choose that my life is worth, worth it, until I fill my own cup, what I give is a lie. What I give is 90% of me, with 10% being I'm not worth it. So what am I standing a source for? Am I going to stand a source for giving half of me? Well, half of me says no and creating conflict in the interactions that I'm having because I have conflict within myself? Or am I choosing to be all in? So yeah, narcissism, yes, but it comes from a place of filling my cup. It comes from a place of creating worth in me and loving myself, mm -hmm. for, first and foremost. Because until I choose to love myself and create emotional wealth, everything that I do is yeah. a lie. I mean, we are talking about like how, you know, just simply getting a girlfriend in the, in the thought that she'll make you happy is the wrong way to approach it. Because like, you want to be happy with yourself before you can be in a relationship and be happy with another person. There is this, you know, example where when you're taking, like, you know, a flight, right, you get on the airplane and, you know, like, the stewardess does all the, the safety checks in the, in the lecture, and they always say, like, if your mother or father or parent with a child and, like, the gas, you know, the oxygen mask comes down, you don't put it on the child, even if that's, you love your child, right? You put it on yourself because you have to help yourself first before you can help anybody, yeah. right? And so I wouldn't use the word narcissism because there's obviously a negative connotation, but there has to be a certain amount of, of I'm going to take care of myself first because once I can start taking care of myself, I can start taking care of other people. I know for a lot of like Asians, like we, we definitely have this sort of humility and humbleness about us where it is definitely taking care of the family, but uh, you know, I also see a lot of students where they are always giving of themselves. They're always sacrificing, but they themselves are just so personally unhappy, mm -hmm. right? And like, you know, when your cup is not full, it gets to the point where you take on these negative characteristics where you start growing resentful, right, of other people because they're happy and you're not. So, so long as you are taking care of yourself and you are being happy and you're not like, you know, hurting other people, it's fine, mm -hmm. right? Because ultimately you do want to go from that process of being just happy to actually being fulfilled for the long term. Yeah, and what I'm hearing in this is there's like a huge either or conversation. I can either take care of myself or take care of others. And the invitation is to live in the both end, is to create both that one does not operate without the other. As I'm taking care of myself, now I'm preparing myself with everything and filling my, my, my cup to give to others, to create value in others, and it becomes this energy exchange or become, you know, that supports the world and going around. It supports relationships, it supports businesses. It's the, a give and a take that in the giving, I'm creating value for others, and in the receiving, I'm giving others an opportunity mm. to give to me. That's gold cool right there. Uh, again, this is JT Tran from the ABCs of Attraction, USA's number one aging dating coach, joined by Andrew, one of the experts at emotional intelligence and inner gain. Uh, we've got maybe like, you know, time for two, maybe more questions before we close out. Uh, so hit like, share with your friends, all right? Um, and ask these questions, okay? Inner gain is a very misunderstood subject, but it is one of the most powerful things. So, Ask now or forever hold your peace, guys. Um, add one was just saying, I was initially worried about when I was dating this girl and I, I guess met her family um, and see this as an opportunity to make myself a high status person. Uh, oh, he, basically, he was concerned about coming up as creepy. Uh, when he met like his girlfriend's family, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, you gotta learn how to give good parents, and obviously, just having an internal belief system that you yourself like, you know, that that their her parents would be proud of their daughter dating a man like you. And it again is that being self-centered enough, or like quote unquote narcissistic enough, to understand that your value, like you have value, and she. And you are both lucky to be in this relationship, and like her parents would be like happy that you're part of her life. 
So I'm thinking at the end of the day, what what's my vision? What is it that I intend to create? From what I'm hearing is you're intending to create um, relationship with your the girl's parents. So have that guide you and have everything else fall to the side and have every misstep that you take be an opportunity for you to come back to the vision. And for me, like what comes up when I hear this is I'm so in stuck in this perfectionism that things have to look a certain way. And by being stuck in it, when the beauty of what is created happens in front of me, I oftentimes overlook it. I don't even see what's being created in front of me because I'm so attached to this figment of imagination that I created on how things are supposed to look. Does that, does that blend? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, thinking with inner game, it is, it is abstract, but I always think that you can take whatever struggle, whatever obstacle that you're experiencing and turn it into your own internal gift, right? If you're worried about, you know, making an impression with, you know, the family, the daughter's family, your girlfriend's family is, hey, you're a man that is actively on, like, you know, taking a boot camp on this, you know, live, watching on YouTube, and you are like one of those rare men who is trying to make his life better, right? You ha you recognize this and you have to put that out there saying like, hey, you know what, I'm always trying to be better, I'm always trying to make, you know, my girlfriend, your daughter better, I am a man that is always improving, right? And hearing all of this, I think it comes down to whether or not I am willing to be vulnerable, mm. to mm. create a acknowledgement of where the relationship is at. Hey, I acknowledge that this is what's happening between us, and... I acknowledge that these are the, the, the things that are happening because of it. And clearing the space, starting from new, now, now that I've acknowledged where we're at and cleared the space, what am I committed to? And having that conversation with whoever I'm interacting with. So for example, if I'm sh consistently showing up late um, to, with a friend, clearing that space. Hey, you know, I acknowledge that I've been showing up late and I realize that it's taking a toll on our relationship. It's causing, at least from my perspective, um, a lack of integrity where I'm creating the space for you to not trust me that when I say I'll be there at 2.30, I'll be there at 2.30. So clearing that space and then saying, cool, you know, I acknowledge it, now what am I committed to? And telling that person I'm committed to moving forward to be my word and be on time. And that, that commitment reestablished the foundation of the friendship reestablish the foundation and the relationship and that translates in my case with this friend you know into every aspect of my life every relationship that I create so for I don't remember who I was saying that I was asking the question Edwin, Edwin. Edwin yeah. for Edwin you know maybe it comes down to having that open honest vulnerable connection to sh create the relationship you desire one thing really uh, before I get to the next question as we wind down is your comment that you know about vulnerability because there is strength in vulnerability all right it is something that differentiates you from so many other men and this is actually something that i incorporate in our in our boot camp and what i've discovered is so powerful because i'm always improving like you know my abcs of attraction boot camp and you know it's got inner game outer game and verbal game and like for the past two years even though i've been at this for over 10 years you know, for the past two years, not a single client has asked for a refund because, you know, I'm always improving not only myself but the program. And I've added so much more inner game. And what I now explore in depth in the boot camp is the idea of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And what we've actually done is actually when you're having an intimate moment with a woman, beyond just physical but emotional, actually putting it out there and telling her, like, hey, I had these deep insecurities that I'm working on improving upon. And what we discovered, what the student discovers, is by admitting that. I mean, you always have to frame it correctly. <laughs> you don't say like, oh, you know, I went to bed until I was 15 years old, right? You don't want to go that far, right? you got to frame it correctly. But by admitting it to a woman that she feels like there's a deeper level of connection, but that you, you obviously wouldn't tell this just to anybody. She feels special. So not only does it help you, it can actually improve your own technique by just admitting to that vulnerability. Yeah. And it creates a sense of intimacy into me, you see. Mm. It's like really letting people know where I'm at, where I'm coming from, as opposed to holding it back when 
a relationship is what I want to create. If I'm holding myself back from it, then there's already a peg in front of us. There's already distance in front of us. So, okay. Yeah. Um, last question. This is kind of like, uh, uh, I think Garrett and John had a similar question, so we just kind of packaged it together. Garrett was saying like, uh, like your feedback on creating new mental frame because he's working as well through medical issues. Mm. And I've turtled up. I find it difficult to maintain confidence when I'm in pain. Um, what is a good mental framework that I can use while dealing with bodily discomfort? So this is basically a, a jump off from you know, the original question from Johnny and from your background where you were like physically burned. So how can he rework his mind when his body is in pain? Mm. Um, like you, I think you. Were, I remember you telling me like how the process of getting over the burn scars. Yeah. Like it was painful because you had to do it on your own, Absolutely. and that was like horrific. Yeah, um, it comes back to what am I committed to? And in terms of me, when I was going through my healing process, it was painful for me to continuously scrub, you know, the scars and make sure they yes. were clean. <laughs> This. He had, to, he had to scrub this every single day, yeah, right? Every time I take a shower. Yeah. Twice a day. Redress. So you understand the pain. There's there's real there's real physical pain and there's psychological pain. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying like that commitment. Like if yeah. your why is big enough, you will get past that. You will yeah. accept it as, you know, I know there's that old, I guess a workout gym kind of saying like pain is just weakness leaving the body. <laughs> Obviously that's not true if you have a medical condition. But I think that if you can accept that, you know, sure, life is unfair, but you use this opportunity, okay, instead of looking at it as just this, this obstacle of, of your, your body um, giving you discomfort, but use this opportunity to be like, okay, you know, I'm going to push through this. This is going to make me stronger. It's something that I can use, you know, if you want to think of tactically when talking to women of like what I'm going through. Because you know what? A woman who can empathize with you through your struggle. It's definitely a woman to keep your eye on as opposed to like a superficial woman that's all like, oh, I want to party. But like, if she can understand your pain and really empathizes, then that is someone that like, hey, this could be like a, a really good person to know whether as a friend or, you know, a serious girlfriend. And coming back to responsibility again and ownership, who am I being to convey that pain to her in an effective manner to create the results that I desire? And it's up to me to communicate with the intention of someone else getting it. Because if I come from a place of, oh, look at me, this is what happened to me, look at me, poor me, poor me, poor me, then they're going to receive it as poor you, poor you, poor you, and why would I want a poor you in my life? Mm -hmm. So being empowered in the things that happened to me. Look at me despite these obstacles that came my way. For example, for me, I, I lit my face on fire, and when it does come up, <laughs> not often that it does, um, it becomes a story of commitment. It becomes mm -hmm. a story where it becomes a story of strength. A strength. A yeah. strength. Where, where at the end of the day, now when I'm brushing my teeth, I don't think about me, even though it's scarlet it's still visible. I don't think about it because yeah. I know for a fact that I did whatever it took to heal it. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how much pain that came with the process, I did whatever it took because my vision was greater. And with me. That I can sleep at the at, at the end of the night. I can go to bed resting that I took care of it. Okay. Uh, these are some really great questions. Again, this is JT Tran from the ABCs of Attraction, USA's number one Asian dating coach. Uh, we're finishing up with Andrew, one of the experts at emotional intelligence and inner game. So, uh, how you know can they find a little bit more? You have Instagram or how can yeah. They so you guys can find me on my Instagram. It's really my personal Instagram, and I'm always open to sharing it because I post a lot of things that I believe are my discoveries. Mm -hmm. I believe that what happens in the collective is happening in the individual. So as I break through things in my life and post about them, I, I, I share it with the public. So my Instagram is D-A-C-H-3-N-M-A-N. Again, that's D-A-C-H-3-N-M-A-N. -N. Okay, be sure to check out his Instagram, and like I promised you guys, you know what? Some of you guys don't know how women view you. I know just in 
you know, one of the original questions, the idea that this guy is carrying on these scars on the inside, even though he physically doesn't have, like, the skin condition anymore, but he carries it on inside him. Mm -hmm. Like, you, here's an objective way to see if you have high dating market value or low dating market value. And I have this quiz. It's a hugely popular. I think it's, like, one of the biggest surveys where you are asked some questions and you actually get a score. Are you dateable or are you not? Like, how high is your dating score so just go to abc's of attraction.com slash quiz that's abc's of attraction.com slash quiz and you'll get your score after answering these questions and again if this advice that we have given you today resonated with you okay private message me because we are giving a promotion on the upcoming los angeles premium boot camp and we've been teaching for over 10 years. I've personally taught at like Harvard, Yale, Wharton School of Business. You can look up my, like, there's literally hundreds of reviews. Like, we actually have so many reviews, we are behind in, like, editing all the, the video reviews. But if this spoke to you, share this with a friend. Private message me about if you're interested in boot camp, interested in the Los Angeles promotion. And next time around, we're going to go for, I think, uh, next Facebook Live next week which will be the 15th, I believe, and it'll be how to increase your sexual market value and working on your fashion and style. So hit us up with questions, okay? And Gary's is asking uh, your, the link to your Instagram. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Jason's on top of it. You just want to give him one more time? Uh, yeah, my Instagram is in the link now that Jason's posted it, and it's D-A-C-H-3-N-M-A-N. Okay, guys, JT Tran signing out. Thanks for, so much for attending my second Facebook Live. Thanks for watching our video. I hope you liked it. And make sure you guys subscribe to this channel and watch all our other videos. Great news, too. Every Monday, we'll be putting out a new weekly video. That's right, we've got educational seminars, street interviews, uh, fun in-field pickup videos, and anything else we can come up with that's fun for you guys to watch. So check back.